Hello, everyone. Uh, here we are in uh, Expressionism Salon number 78. Uh, my name is Michael Pierre Price. Uh, I'm a Expressionist artist out of Phoenix, Arizona. And today we're talking about text and art. And to me, this is a really interesting subject that I'll talk about uh, just a little bit. And we've got two main presenters today and several other artists who will be sharing work. Um, but I wanted to mention um, an ongoing project that we just had our launch uh, called Siberiana. And it is a wonderful Web3 space where uh, more than 40 artists, I think we're up to at this point, internationally are represented in Siberiana with very, very diverse uh, art presentations. Uh, and if you can get there, I suggest that you check it out. Um, Siberiana.studio. Um, and it's a wonderful uh, project that we have launched and we'll be updating it over the next couple of months. And Something kudos to all of Expressionism. Uh, Siberiana has also been incorporated into the Wrong Biennial, and I think that's also a, you know a wonderful thing for us. Um, so we've we've got a new year that we're starting here, and this idea of mixing text with art and what does that mean? Um, so it's such a fascinating topic because as human beings and our uh, need to communicate. Um, we began with images and then language, and then language evolved into written words and letters and different kinds of letters. Different languages have evolved. Letters combined together make words. Words make sentences, sentences into paragraphs, into stories, into poetry so many rich ways in which we communicate as human beings with one another. And the idea as artists looking to communicate our points of view, being able to incorporate text into it in so many different ways is also a wonderful um, concept to be able to incorporate. And um, so anyway, we have two presenters, main presenters today. Uh, our first presenter, Karen LaFleur. Uh, Karen is a expressionist artist, writer, and animator. Her work explores the interplay between interior and exterior worlds with a focus on adaptability. Text image relationships are central to her creative process. Each artwork evolves from words written by the artist, whether used within the artwork or implied. She borrows freely across genres from art to the pitch, picture book, graphic novels, sudden fiction, film, and improvisational dance. Interesting. Uh, and so um, her, her works have been displayed in many, many museums and venues. And so, uh, Karen, we're really happy to have you present today. And it's all up to you now. Thank you. Thank you. This is a subject I really love. And thank you for the intro, Michael, because this is a huge, huge topic that can go in a million different directions, all fascinating. Um, and I'm just going to speak to, to my corner. And the things that I say today are going to be just stepping stones that I've discovered along the way to push the envelope of this genre further. So what I say are not rules, they're discoveries. And I'm going to start my presentation. And I'll ask if you can see my screen. Yes. Great. I want to go to. Ah, great. Zoom is in the way. Okay. Here we go, right out of the bat. Zoom is in the way and I can't get to the play button. <laughs> play, there we go. Finally. Okay, so I'm going to start uh, my presentation um, 
with a opening paragraphs to my thesis, uh, just to sort of set the stage for what I want to talk about today. So bear with me. This is going to be a very fast and full presentation. The Oxford English Dictionary defines writing as the penning or forming of letters or words, the using of written characters for purpose of rec record and for transmission of ideas, etc. The literary critic Roland Barthes states that any drawing or graphism or mode of motivated inscription not bound to the tasks of visual speech or formal legible characters, such as in an alphabet, but instead is directed towards conveying the restless energy of the body via some normal handheld tool, such as painting and drawing, is also a form of communication. While Simon Morley, the author of the book, Writing on the Wall, combines these two approaches and implies that within the context of these two definitions, the distinction between drawing and writing often breaks down, and yet text and image still relate, even though each retains its separate characteristics. In other words, the act of writing and drawing is similar and that we scan both methods for content or idea, and we also use both methods to create marks on a page to communicate. But here the similarities separate. The process by which we extract meaning is totally different. We can't read and observe at the same time because these tasks occur in different parts of our brain. The reading brain leans towards the rational, logical, and discursive to read, and the image deciphering brain leans towards the intuitive to interpret an image. Uh, physically, we can't do both processes at once. Visually scanning a drawing, says Morley, involves openness of interpretation and freedom of mental and sensual movement, while reading confines the reader to a predetermined route constructed in the needed in between the levers department. Can we ask anyone who's not speaking to mute yourselves, please? Visually scanning a drawing, says Morley, involves openness of interpretation and freedom of mental and sensual movement, while reading confines the reader to a predetermined construct from a row of letters to be deciphered in a direction, left to right, right to left, top to bottom, or vice versa. And although we can process both skills alternately at a very rapid rate, and here's where I want to emphasize where I'm going to talk about today. The actual connection between word and image takes place in an associative space, in an in-between world that pits the arbitrary visualization of an image against the defined letter formation of reading and its grammatical rules. So hopefully that wasn't too much to read to you, but it does set up what I'm trying to talk about today. So let's get started. All my artwork, whether it's representational or it's abstract, or has uh, text in it or not, is stems from something that I've written or I have a story concept for. The genre that I work in is sudden fiction. It's a brief story less than 750 words. It takes place in a single setting. It's told in a brief time span and contains a limited numbers of characters. But most importantly, it speaks with immediacy, professes an uneasy familiarity and teeters on the brink of revelation. And I think these last three bullet areas is a way that we can come into, at least for myself, from text to image. It's in this in-between zone where I almost get it. I can't quite say what it is, but I have to make relationships between two things, text and image. Simon Morley's book, The Writing on the Wall, uh, was an eye opener for me when I read this book. It's an older book, very hard to find right now. And there are many theories out there that writing and text and image together are seven things, they're nine things, but he breaks it down into four, which I could actually get my head around as a launching pad to be able to do my artwork. Forget the titles on this, guys. This is from a course that I taught on this subject. All you really need to figure out is that there's four different areas that you can use text and image in order to create your artwork and start to manipulate uh, that associative space between the two to affect your audience. 
The first way is uh, you have an image of something and then there's a description of something. So they're separate. But if you took one away, you could read about the bird. If you had the image, you'd be able to see and understand the bird. They're relating, but they're totally separate. The other way you can use text and image in an artwork is uh, where text and image share the same space, but they retain their own functions. So you see this in graphic novels and comics where you have a bullet of text uh, so that the bubble is working its own technique and the image is working its own technique, but they're in the same narrative space. They're not separate. The next way we're all understand as artists is mixed media, it's in folding, it's in scr uh, scrambling things together so that you have one piece of artwork with your text and your image. And the last way Morley suggests is to work with the actual letter form itself. Um, and that's not just making one decorative letter, you can literally have a second story happening visually in the letter form while you're actually reading the text. And they're setting up an associative space for the audience. So the artist needs to know what the associated uh, elements resonate in the artwork that you either want to create or a text that you've read and how these two are going to work together. So like on the left, you might say, oh, I want to have this as interconnection. So you might be unfolding. You might be uh, using it more like a graphic novel where you're having elements in the same plane but they retain their own uh, separate uh, narrative functions. Or like on the right, if it's reflection, you may be using the sort of the hornbill technique where you have one and the other. So this gave me a way to sort of step into text and image and start to incorporate it in my artwork. I'm gonna start with this one, which is from my first series, and I'm going to read the story because often we don't get the story when we're showing in these visual presentations. That kid ain't worth a hop spit in a can, my father said the night Nathan asked me to marry him. I was 18, shiny and new, and Nathan drove a Detroit special, cream over red with taillights that commented through the dark. Moving, always moving, that's how I remember Nathan, and I longed to go with him to see what lay beyond the stop signs of Dillon County. So we began, behind a fence, under a tree, backlit by bedroom window light, laughing on fender top, his hips against mine. And for a moment, my world stopped waiting for someone to care. I asked my father's permission to marry out of respect for my mother. She wouldn't dare give her consent without his, and I wasn't about to make her life any harder. No, was all my father replied. Nathan stepped forward, but I pulled him away, and I left my home in a tire spin that peeled a final goodbye in a hail of pebble and stone. That night, Nathan and I drove through every stop sign that came our way, careening under a starlight sky, night driving all the way down to Coopersville past the drive-in theater on Route 93. We traveled fast on a beam of incandescent light, up over hill and into the soft of everywhere all at once, lovers chasing down journey's end, only to pull up short on the backside of a waning moon. Nathan loved to drive, but he loved me more, so when our first child came, he sold his car to a man over in Bakersfield. Then we settled down and held on to each other tight against the rotation of the world. That's something my father never understood, that sometimes you've got to give up what seems important for the other part you know is right. So this is about 500 words. It's a sudden fiction. The way the associative space is set up in this piece is the actual plot running you know, uh, is on the right. This is the reality. On the left, there's a reflection of the character on a car fender, and the words are sort of handwritten, half reflective on the fender, which is setting up sort of a reflection of the character's self versus her reality, and the skid mark in the middle is the, the demarcation line between change. So that's how this is set up for the audience. And I'll go through these other ones real quickly, because many you've seen before. This is on the cadence of the overall story. When the character is like, wow, I don't really get this. I'm scared, whatever. Oh, I get it. The text goes back up. It goes down. So it's working literally with the cadence of the overall narrative. This one here is nothing but associative space. 
the main character in the center is looking backwards, well, sort of, but he could also be looking at you. The hand almost touches the shoulder, but not quite. The word I in the upper left-hand corner is almost invisible. And the first sentence says, I do not count the years since my disappearance. So we have no idea where this character is because there's an ancient dress that he's in, but there's a, a, a modern pink watch. And in the text, there's all breaking up between and yet's and, and, and other texts that break the text and also in time. So everything about this is to push the associative space on the reader or viewer. This one here is set up like a train. The character is, is basically saying, I don't care if there aren't any acrobats or tigers around here, someday I'm going to join the circus. So it's set up like a circus train except I've used the actual letter form itself flipped on its side as couplings between the train cars. That's how the narrative engine is, is on this particular piece. This one here, I ended up uh, reversing what we normally have as a text and we make imaginary pictures in our head. Instead, I gave you the story visually in one shot and you need to bring the text to the image. This is Rapunzel, which most people uh, know, and it was actually done for a, a lit uh, conference. So uh, they had a lot of fun trying to bring the text to the image. Again, setting up an associative space between both, which kind of leads into narrative engines, which I'll get to in a few seconds. This piece here, on first glance, looks like it is a graphic novel setup, but it's not. It's actually the narrative engine is a picture book. The graphic novel elements within this are the bulleted text, but the actual narrative engine of the story is by the page flip, because each one of these genres I'll talk about has an engine to make the story go forward. It's set up on page spreads, so everything happens up to a point, and then there needs to be a page flip, even though there's graphic novel elements in it. So for the picture book, it's the page turn. Everything is, is focused for that. For a graphic novel, um, it's a sequential imagery. That's what's driving the engine of the story. They may use a page flip here and there, but the overall story is be, being driven by sequence. And the illustrated book has a picture which references back to the text. It enhances it from a, a large body of text. So just to show you a few quick examples, this is Josephine Poole's uh, Snow White, beautiful book, by the way. This is a page spread picture book obviously driving you to the right because in English we read from left to right so for us to go from left to right feels like the story is motivated to go ahead if we reverse that we feel hesitation um, depending on your language and your text that scenario is going to change but in English it's left to right so here's this character flying down the hill you know, careening down. She's got wild characters that recede way back into the imagery you can't really see in this picture, you can in the book. And we know she's going to be in trouble because we have these upright trees that anyone knows when you're out of control running down a hill and there's a whole bunch of trees, you're probably going to hit one or two. So it's setting up the reader for trouble ahead. If you reverse that in English, it sets up a sense of resistance. It sets up a sense of, uh, wait a minute, why am I going here? And these different associative spaces you can use with your text and image, whether it's abstract or representational, depending upon the feeling that you want to get across to the audience. Here we have sequential work uh, in graphic novels. Everything about this panel is to do the slow shoulder turn. The, the awareness is the character in the bottom panel. We actually see what in a picture book we would see in a page turn. It's the character, uh, which is underneath the zoom, so I can't read it, but basically said, basically, oh, it's you. So yes, there is a page turn in graphic novels, but the overall story is driven by sequence. An illustrated book enhances a body of text. On the left, you have Trina Shard Hyman's Peter Pan, and she is literally showing you what's going on in the text. On the right, if I didn't caption this, you would not think Frankenstein. 
but this is from Barry Moses beautiful edition of Frankenstein. Uh, it's, 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 it's quite a beautiful book actually if you get your hands on it. Um, so he is setting up an associative space for the audience to say what is in this text that's relating to this uh, image that's open and broad it's not telling me much so he's really forcing the envelope do these overlap absolutely they overlap this is neil gaiman's and david mckeon's the day i swapped my dad for two goldfish this is a picture book this is driven by the page turn but it's using graphic elements within the text and they are a great team as everyone in this audience i'm sure knows so they really know when to use elements uh, and let one step forward and the other one step back in order to drive a story to get an associative space with the audience to the text, to the image. If you wanna just look at how does the image drive sequence, look at Sean Tan's uh, The Arrival. This is a major award winner book for wordless graphic novel. Look at Hugo Cabre. Um, this book is really interesting because it's basically a novel. You would think it's an illustrated book because it has pictures, but he has 20, 15, 10 pages of, of these beautiful, large uh, graphic uh, drawings in, in the book. So you need to flip the page. Hello, it's picture book in the middle of a novel. He takes different pictures within that book and breaks them up. And now he's playing with graph, uh, graphic novel. So he's got all elements in this book, which brings it to, to my work. And um, unfortunately, the Zoom is over the part that I wanna read, but you can read what the text is to this image. This is what I do when I create these pieces. I have some kind of a text that's going to show up. It, sometimes it's a full story, sometimes it's just a line like this. The bus ride from Tulsa, was enough for her for a lifetime. Then she saw Angela. That's where this piece comes from. What the sun said to the moon. And I can't read the rest, but you can. <laughs> Don't tell anyone, but. Um, and that brings me to what I'm doing today. And what I'm doing today is taking text and image and putting it into uh, the animated world, film world, where we're getting into almost a virtual world. And I'm bringing elements of page turn, I'm being, bringing elements of sequencing, when does something step forward, when does it go back in order to derive what's being said. So this piece here is a beta version, and I'm going to show you two parts. One's going to be the beginning for a minute or so, and there's going to be a blank spot, and then there'll be another section from the story further down the story. Um, parts of it aren't finished, parts will have text in it. Right now it's just visual. This is from a series of stories that I wrote about children that I met in the hospital when I was a child. And it's not stories about doom and gloom, it's stories about learning how to be human in a very, very Mad Maxian world where you had no control over anything. We bonded together like gangs in the hospital. This story is called Speaking in Distal. This one is about a nurse came to me one day and she said, go to this room for a week every day and play with this child. She's alone. So I said, okay, fine, I will. But when I got there and in time they didn't even have this word, the child was severely autistic, completely non-communicative. So I had to learn how to communicate with her. This is speaking in distal. The nurse who always sang when she gave you an injection bent to my eye level and said, can you do me a favor? I pressed on the cotton swab after she pulled the needle out of my arm, but I knew by the tone of her voice she meant more because nurses in a hospital ward for critically ill children in the early 60s never asked for favors unless it was to assist in a medical procedure. Hold this, straighten your arm, take a deep breath. 
I wanted to run from her words out of the room, down the stairs, onto the sidewalk to catch the first bus home past my mom and dad and my cat named Cindy, up the stairs and past my brother playing on guitar behind his closed room door and into my bedroom with the yellow daisy wallpaper and a teddy bear I kept on my pillow worn to patches from ten years of too much love and I wanted to hide under my bed with that teddy bear tucked away from the pain of yet another medical invasion. But I knew better than to run from the inevitable, because sometimes the distance between a dream and necessity is only a reflection apart. Sure, I said. She looked through me as if glass until I showed her the forest of green butterflies. That's when my fingers stopped and her eyes shifted to my page. Not me, just to my page. With my free hand, I moved my fingers in abstract shapes in front of the butterflies while Linda returned her finger pattern, not matching mine, but speaking to mine in her own way. And that was the day I learned to speak in distal, the art of speaking beyond babble over the gap between difference making a leap via the heart along the outer rim of connection, and for the first time recognizing the power of empathy to break the fear of isolation and misunderstanding. All centers are beginnings, some branch inward, some branch outward, the center being the junction of both. Do I flee? Do I stand? Do I speak? Do I remain silent? Do I see or do I ignore? There is a choice. In my center chose Linda with a green butterfly, and she chose the power to fly on lime green wings. So may you all find wonderful centers and associative spaces in your text image journeys. I hope that wasn't too much too fast, but it's a large subject. Thank you. Wow. Thank you. That was gorgeous. Magnificent. You're that was welcome. brilliant, Karen. Thank you so very much. Uh, not only did you teach, but you taught in a way that I think really hits at the artist in all of us. So yeah, brilliantly done. Thank you so much. Yes. I, I, I'm very honored to be able to get the text in the presentation too, because it's so hard to show this artwork sometimes because you do need time to do it. Thank you. Sure. And we're gonna leave uh, the Q and A to the end. So if anybody does have a question and you don't want to forget it, please feel free to add it to chat and we we can do the Q&A after all the presentations are done. Okay, our other featured presenter today is Seth Indigo Carnes, also known as SICK. Uh, Seth is a visual artist with a practice led by concept and process. His projects traverse physical and digital media, material and immaterial states and the human experience within this flux. His ongoing project, Poetics, is a visual poetry app in use across the world and for his experiments in contemporary poetics. Uh, his past collaborations include work with Paul Miller, DJ Spooky, uh, Shepard Ferry, uh, Terry Jeffrey, David Ellis, and Simona Blatt. So, uh, we are very welcome to have Seth presenting today, and Seth, I'm going to leave it all to you now. Thanks. Thanks, Michael, uh, for the kind introduction, and thank you, uh, Karen, for your presentation uh, before mine. Um, I hope I can do justice following you up, following up your presentation. And um, I think it's interesting to see, like she said, all the all the takes um we can have on um text and art um it's interesting especially because uh, how just the word text itself um 
most, you know, most of us think of text as the letter forms on a page. Uh, I'll go ahead and go ahead and share my screen, by the way. Um, I did put, I did put this, um, link into the zoom chat. They're just, uh, it's just a link tree with some of the links that I'll go over. Um, and, and sorry, before I jump into it, I also want to say that I had the, uh, the pleasure, uh, as it were of having, uh, COVID as my gift for Christmas. So, uh, I'm just getting over it, uh, my Paxlovid today. And so this presentation will probably be a little more informal than, uh, I might've imagined it. Uh, so basically I'm going to go through a few websites and if anyone wants to interject or, um, ask questions or, um, speak, um, I'm happy to sort of stop and, and go, um, but, but back to the idea of text, I, I do think it's kind of interesting that um, we do have a sort of idea of text uh, as a written form that represents ideas and concepts and then comes together in sentences and paragraphs and storytelling that is structured in the West, for example, top left, bottom right. Um, but also we come from we come from a, a place where a lot of this text was rooted in uh, symbols and even pictographs when you go to the Asiatic languages. And those pictograms do have a representative pictorial meaning um still a good amount of them uh that that that, that actually are drawings um in text so when, when when we look back on this sort of original um form uh, of language and how it was constructed um that's that's sort of an area that fascinates me but also to bring it into um sort of art making and, and um sign and symbol and meaning making in in in, in this century um so i think i think probably will help um to show a little bit uh, of of a few projects that led to this poetry app, um, it just happen, happens to be in the collage right now uh, on the my landing page. But I want to move this browser a little down so I can access this site a little better. And move this over here. Um, so I I actually came to poetry and sort of symbolic language from a project I started a long time ago. It was called I Heart. And um, it's, it actually was a sort of symbol. It started with a sort of exploration of symbolic meaning. And you can see here, I started working with signs. Uh, in this case, it was uh, making use of some of the pop language and flipping the uh, I love New York, um, messaging that Milton Glaser um, created so fabulously uh, back in the day for New York City um, and started working with the, with the idea of this, um, the idea of love and these different symbol making. So the original work was were just these different signs uh, and playing with the sort of uh, power and uh, interpretation of their meaning. Um, these are just paintings, for example. Um, and then I eventually started moving into um, outdoor work um, with the concept. So I'll show this, just this one probably is a good one to show. Um, you can see it's the year 2008. I had a studio in the meatpacking district. So in this case, it was below my studio. Uh, I'm not a big lover of meat, but in this case, it is um, a, a love of the symbolic sort of representation of what was going on um, in, that, in that social capital economic, you know, crossover space that was the sort of um, central, the sort of energy of, of that time is long gone. But you can see here that um, that mural was sort of placed sort of in sort of a, I don't know, it, it's more of a social context work here, um, where the idea was to place it and see what happens. Um, there's a video and whatnot. I, I won't jump into because I want to kind of move on. Um, because what I started looking into was the idea of this language. And if, if there's a way that I could start taking the symbolic language and turn it into a, a, a type of authorship that changes over time. Um, so I had done a project at PS1. I met a curator there who had a show in Sweden and she kindly supported this uh, idea of, of writing. Uh, the basic concept was I want to write a poem that is structured and final in its form, but then can change in the hands of its uh, participants and viewers. So in this case, it was a fabrication of a large piece of steel. Uh, the poetry broken down into the sort of uh, format of the fridge magnets, but in a, at a large scale. Um, and uh, it was in Lund, Sweden. Uh, and you can see here that I, I was basically doing research, uh, research within the, the artwork and the uh, installations themselves. And in this case, it was what what happens when I uh, when I author a a, a poem. Uh, I'm going to is the music playing, by the way. I don't, I don't want it to. No, it's not. Okay, good. 
so here we have the idea of like the authorship changing over time and what, what happens to the symbolic meaning, um, whether it's in collaboration or um, interaction with some, one person looking at, looking at the next piece. Um, and I did a bunch of work like this. And the idea was like, where, where, where can this lead? What, what, kind of, um, what kind of artistic format can I use? And I also was researching um, kind of the 20th century work in this area. Like there's the chance operations of Dada, um, then the Surrealists. And then in later times, we saw Fluxus um, working in this area with playful kind of collage works. Um, William Burroughs and Brian Geisen uh, working with this idea of the cut up. And I think probably one of the quotes that really impacted me, which is like kind of captures all of Burroughs and Geisen's work, which is that when you are able to cut into the present, you kind of allow the future to bleed through. I don't think, I think that's paraphrasing the quote, but in a way it's like releasing your authorship and the, the moment and also your, your ego and your, and your sort of intent uh, to the operations, uh, either of your own hand uh, or your gesture or, or that of others. So eventually that led to, um, I don't know, what year was that? I think it was like 2000, the late 2000s that the iPhone came out. And I started to realize that the same kind of gestures that were going on with that work um, in these physical manifestations of, of sort of poetic authorship, I could I could realize that with the iPhone because it had the touch screen. So um, we started putting together the idea of this app where the same kind of the same kind of concept could be executed in a digital form uh, within an app. In this case, I started thinking of the thinking of the work more as like a kind of object oriented uh, language, you know, in the sense that each word and symbol. In this case, it was text and fonts and also some emoji because that was the sort of um, that was in, embedded within. The, the sort of language usage of the iPhone um, could be placed and moved and lifted. And in this case, uh, I, I built a physics engine inside the phone. Um, and I think probably a good way to show how this goes is to just play the video because I'm not, I don't want to, I don't have um, the ability at this point. Um, these are some of those projects that kind of led to this uh, work. Um, oh, sorry. It's on this, it's on the site for the actual app. So let's jump over to Poetx. This is the poetx.app site. Um, it's available on the app store, by the way, if anyone would like one, you can just let me know. I can even give you a code. So this is showing the app in action. Um, in this case, it's actually uh, playing off of, um, let's see, let's get it to play. You're not going to see my hands, but this, my hands are actually, this is, this is a screen capture of the, of the app in use. And the collisions are a physics engine that allow one word to sort of nudge and push the other. And one thing is probably worth mentioning, unlike a lot of sort of computer or coded um, poetry projects these days. I didn't really ever want to do anything like machine learning or AI. Like the idea here is the human and the body is still involved with these gestures. And it's really just using all the, the digital technology to sort of um, create a kind of fluid authorship rather than depend on like um, suggestions from an AI or, you know, a lot of things where it's like, oh, you know, just put in five words and let AI, AI write the poem for you. And I, I think that's interesting, but it's just not, not particularly interesting for me. Um, so um, that sort of leads, you know, so the, the, this project came out, the, the, the app was used, you know, kind of all over the place for all kinds of reasons. Even teachers downloaded it. It's been used in schools. Um, I've done projects with like the New York Department of Education um around its usage there but from the art world standpoint and from a poetry standpoint um i'm i've tried to kind of move it towards um 
another version of this concept. And so the latest one I want to try doing is the app has its own format. It has its own file format. And I have a, I'm working with a collective. Um, it's called TXT. So in this case, it's TXT from a semiotic standpoint, like the, the actual text, it could be the image. It could be, it could be a symbol. It could be text. It's sort of like, what is the sort of uh, sign and symbol uh, combination? So there are some visual artists. There's some sculptors in this group. Uh, and we're putting together a virtual exhibition uh, and working uh, in the realm of um, NFTs uh, and the blockchain and also uh, the metaverse in terms of the gallery presentation of the work. So you can see like this piece right here is one made in the app. Uh, it's called This Is It. Uh, in this case, it's, uh, you know, it's just a still image and it's just the text on there. But the actual file format itself, I, I call it the dot .poetic. It's like a dot .jpeg. The artwork itself will be that flat image, but also the interactive file format, and it'll be wrapped as an NFT. So the idea there is that you will be able, you will be, the artwork itself is, is sort of infinitely editable. It, 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 the, it has, it will have frames of work that I generate, which is like, for example, it's, it will be, this is it. Is this it? It, it will have a few different flows and, and frames, but essentially the artwork is in the hands of of the person who receives it. And it will then open up in the app uh, and that's how it, it, it will be possible to edit it. Um, so I don't know if it's this, we're, we're still putting this exhibition together. I know that this uh, your group has done NFTs and uh, some kind of virtual exhibitions too. So I thought it would be worth sharing uh, this project as something that uh, we're working on. Um, and I think the only, uh, we're making a book, we're going to also release the book as an NFT. Uh, and the idea here is not just to jump on the NFT bandwagon, but also to um, play play with the idea of the written word within a book. And that same artwork in the book represented in a gallery that's in the metaverse, but also to to actually give it provenance, you know, like to give to give it the sort of artist contract that if someone has it, they know who made it, how many are out there. And if there are any, if there if it's if you pay for it or if it's given for free it's known and it's locked into code and i think we're we're just really interested in that part of, of the innovation in in nfts um and i just wanted to show you like so you can see here just i i, I did put it on the website that that this artwork you know you will be able to buy it and display it on a screen i, I haven't really worked out the physical aspect and it's really important uh for me to sort of find that merger, but it, I have found, and I don't know if other artists in this group have found, when I made the move from the, all the physical manifestations and iterations of this concept into the digital space, um, I find myself natively digital now with this work. Like I can make prints, you know, easily. I, I, there could be prints on all different kinds of medium media. It could even be painted, you know, the, all kinds of physical representations can be made of this, but I don't, I have not found a way where it naturally moves back to the material. Uh, world and I don't even I don't know if it has a home there this this work for example this part but I but I but I think it's interesting that that we find ourselves in this in this moment where and I and I, I know that the artists in this group ha, are working in that area as well which is the sort of that liminal space between um, digital physical uh, analog virtual you know etc cetera, etc cetera. it's it's a it's a it's a nice place to be in I think it is it's the future and it's surely evolving but it's also sometimes a uh, um, a, a mental and physical contortion to deliver <laughs> deliver your work in a in a way that lands true to true to the soul so I think uh, I think I can end it there I mean there there are plenty of other things to share um I think if you if anyone has questions or wants to talk, uh, I think the Q and A will probably be a better place to uh, speak further. And there's some other projects like I, that I did on Governor's Island. This project called the House of Poetics that actually was physical and was an installation in a house uh, centered on text and poetry. But I think it's better to kind of leave it leave it at that. Uh, and maybe we can move on and uh, speak further in the salon if that works for everyone. Sure. Thanks, Seth. Um... Really, really interesting concepts here. I, I know we will have some uh, discussions after the presentations are done with both you and, and Karen's work. So yeah, this is this is really, really intriguing. So thank you very much. Thank you. Happy to be here.
Michael, All right. can, Michael, can I just step in for one yeah, second sure, before sure. we proceed? Thank you, Sick. That was that was brilliant because I'm sitting here for a week figuring out which way do I go with this because I had the presentation on your side too. This is a huge subject. This can go everywhere. And I am so glad that you brought up language as being um, sort of a primary symbolic form of communication rather than just text. Because to me, language and text and image and all forms of that kind of communication is improv. It's in a 3D space, it's in a world, it's in dance, it's in gesture everywhere. And when we take our text and we put it between two covers, somehow we get separated from it. So thank you for putting that spin on it. And it was great. Yeah, yeah, I agree 100%. Sometimes you get, we, we are, we're so locked down from the Western, uh, especially for the printing press revolution, that it's just sort of like you have to lock it down, you have to have it set, and then you have to put it on paper. Uh, and that, that's that's the final form, um, which is not always the case. And sometimes, obviously, it's good to, to yeah. put your pen down. <laughs> <laughs> well, thank you to both uh, main presenters today. Um, so we have a couple other presentations um, that are the, that are following here. And next up is Sherry Carver. Thank you. Thank you. Um, I'll just give a brief introduction uh, to myself and then I'll, I'll get into showing you some images. Uh, I am a non-traditional photographer. Uh, photography is the basis of all of my series uh, but it's not the end result. Um, I take hundreds of photos and then I do a lot of different things with them. So let me start by screen sharing. And let me open this up bigger. Okay, can everybody see that? Yes. yes? Okay. Um, all right, so I'll, I'll talk a little bit about uh, how this work started. Uh, while this one is up on the screen, and then I'll go through the other um, pictures a little bit more quickly. Uh, I photograph in public places. Grand Central Station in New York is one of my favorites. Metropolitan Museum, uh, city streets in New York, Paris, Chicago, wherever I happen to be. And I take hundreds of photos. This one is made up of maybe five to 10 different images that I collage together on the computer using Photoshop. Um, and I'm really interested in uh, these crowd scenes and how do we as an individual stand out from the crowd? Because we all have a story to tell. And often in our fast paced world, uh, we end up with issues, individual and societal issues like alienation and loneliness. And uh, like I said, how do we stand out? Um, how do we perceive other people? How do we judge other people? Uh, and so about 20 some years ago, I decided to start to add text to some of my work as, as a way to give people a voice uh, since we each have a story. And I really appreciate text as pattern or texture. But for me, I felt that the text really needed to say something. It had to have some kind of meaning and correlation to my figures. So I started to write little uh, fictional biographies, you might call them, on several people in my images. And here I have four different uh, characters, and I'll read you just one of them. Um, Let's go to the next one and I'll, I'll read you. So this is the girl that was on the lower left-hand corner. And I'll, I'll just read you so you don't have to put on your glasses. Sometimes I write in first person, sometimes in third person. I give each character uh, their own font that I feel represents them the most. And I try to say something about them um, maybe that is a little humorous. Maybe they wouldn't want people to know about them. Uh, again, it's totally made up based on how people look to me, how they stand, maybe how they walk, because I'm a people watcher. Maybe some of you are too. And if I'm on a, a train, if I'm in a cafe, if I'm walking down the street and I see somebody, I start to wonder, well, who are they? 
and what do they do and where are they from um, and what are they into? And so I decided to just make up these little stories rather than interviewing anybody because I really don't want this to be a documentary project, but rather a fine art project. So here this woman is speaking to the guy and this one is in first person and she says, we're so opposite. I don't see how this will ever work out between us. We're from different countries. We have different religions. We have opposing political views. I want one child, you want four. I have a master's degree and you dropped out of high school. You love watching sports and I prefer reading poetry. So what do you say we get married at City Hall today? So I always try to say something, you know, a little bit humorous and maybe, you know, that they wouldn't want other people to know. So let me go on to the next one. Okay, and the piece that I just showed you, that's called uh, Edge of Civility and Contradiction, and it was 33 inches by 43 inches. Okay, this one uh, is called, let's see, let me get to turn my page here. Uh, River of Continuity, uh, 40 inches by 24 inches. And I also want to mention that the areas towards the back, you know, I don't know if you can see my pointer, uh, the back area at the top, and some of them are sort of grayed out. And that represents, for me, the element of time. Uh, the people who have been in the same place maybe a minute before I was there, or maybe 10 years before I got there, or maybe they will be there five years in the future, that we're all moving on this time continuum. So that's what those grayed out areas uh, represent. So I'm not going to read you the text on every single person. Uh, you know, I pick out certain people. Sometimes they just jump out to me like, oh, I have to put text on this person and give them, you know, a voice. Uh, and other times I really have to work at it to figure out, you know, who, who gets the words and, and who doesn't. So let me continue. Sometimes I also incorporate uh, vintage black and white images that you can see here on the left with my contemporary photos. This also represents uh, the passage of time uh, and how the past influences the current and the future and how we relate back to things that happened in our past. Uh, this one is called Background of Our Future. Uh, it's 30 inches by 40 inches. And I will read you the text on uh, this little figure here, the man uh, on the left-hand side. So just to let you know how I make these. So once I get the composition to the way I want it with the figures I want, and I choose the ones who are gonna get text, uh, I write the text all on the computer uh, in Photoshop, and then I print it all out in black and white and I adhere it to wood panels and all of the color I hand paint with oil glazes. And the final coating is a resin coat. Sometimes I'll paint over the resin um, and then I'll do another resin pour on top of that. So it ends up with a glossy surface and these images are embedded into that surface. Okay, so I'll read you this, this gentleman here on the left uh, from a vintage photo. Vacuum cleaner salesman has been traveling for three days to come to his younger sister's wedding in the big city, has never been outside of Tuscaloosa, wonders if they have the same kind of food he's used to, misses his dog sitting on the front porch and playing his fiddle, and just realized he brought the suitcase with vacuum cleaner hoses instead of his toothbrush and fresh pair of underwear hopes nobody gets close enough to notice. So I always try to say something, you know, as I mentioned, embarrassing or a little bit funny. I think we need to have a little more humor in our work. At least I do. Um, there's not enough humor in the world. Um, and so I always try to say something a little bit, a little bit funnier. Okay, let me move on. Okay, this is the guy. This is what I just read to you. Um, sometimes I'll photograph uh, in a cafe. This is a scene in Paris. Uh, and again, I put text on uh, the woman here on the left, the guy in the back, and the woman here on, on the right side. And again, I'm not going to read all of it. Uh, but, but they're all made up. It's all made up text. 
Here's the woman on, on the right. Uh, this is called At the Bend in the Road. It's 36 inches by 42 inches, and it's a street scene uh, in Paris. Uh, again, text is on uh, three of the figures. I usually do three, occasionally four, but normally three. You have to give people a voice. Okay, this one is called The World is Movement, uh, Grand Central Station, again, uh, this tall man here in the middle has text, girl in the back, this one here on, on the right. This is called Roadmap of Life. It's uh, 25 inches by 30 inches. And I'll read you the text on, on this guy here uh, in the middle. Let me see if I have a picture of him here on this guy. 26-year-old manager of a health food restaurant sneaks fries and candy in his pocket, adds a little whiskey to his coffee, worries he'll lose his job if anyone finds out, especially his mother, who always said he wouldn't amount to much, would really like to be a jazz musician, play the blues in Chicago clubs, hobnob with cool people, wear a fedora, smoke a pipe, and have a girlfriend who wears spiked heels and accepts him the way he is. Move on. Uh, and another one of my favorite places in New York is the Metropolitan Museum. And I happened to come upon the sculpture court there purely by accident. I was actually upstairs on the second floor about to go into a photo exhibit when I saw this little window on the second floor. And when I looked down through that window, uh, it was onto the sculpture court below. And I became really interested in the juxtaposition of contemporary figures with these uh, ancient statues. So I decided to also put words on the sculptures uh, as well as on some of the people uh, in order to give them some anthropomorphic qualities. And I had to do quite a bit of research because I really didn't know much about Greek mythology at all. Um, and so I did it on many of the figures, but I'm gonna show you this figure way in the back here um, on the right side, which is the sculpture called Venus. And this is my last uh, image that I'll show you. And Venus is saying, I really don't like being naked in front of all these people, even if they think I'm beautiful, though I'm not even the original Venus. And it's quite nippy in here. And I wish I had a nice long toga like Sappho, but she doesn't have the great body that I do. So I always try to say something funny. And I have felt that by adding text to my work, it, it really engages the viewer and it pulls the viewer in to spend at least a few more seconds with my work and become part of my process by reading. And that's it. So thank you so much for listening. And I was really honored to be included with, uh, with Karen and Seth, whose work I love both of them. So thank you, I'm going to stop sharing. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks, Sherry, very much. Very cool. <laughs> I love the stories. We all think things like that at times. So uh, it's it's good to kind of see that right, right in front. So that's really neat. Thank you, Michael. Okay, uh, next up, uh, Renata. Thank you. you. Here, right? Oh, yeah. Okay, Thank there. You. <laughs> Thank you, Michael. And it's been a really interesting set, three sessions. I was just looking at Sherry Carver's um, work that she does make, making puzzles. There's a um, fascination for typography with me. And like some of the other artists who spoke, I treat often type or text as a decorative quality. And this goes back to my interest in medieval art and specifically the illuminated manuscripts that were produced, but usually by monks. And this particular one is in the Metropolitan Museum's collection. It's not on public display, but it's um, 
translation into Spanish of the City of God by St. Augustine, and the artist's name was Cano de Aranda. And what I really liked about the manuscripts was, um, some of you will likely know what kerning is. They're perfectly kerned, even though they're not typeset. And the more I look at the way they wrote and the way this artist used the space, the more admiration I had for him. And they spent a long time creating the books. This is a close-up of the, the illuminated letter O with, with an illustration. And I'm going to show you some of my letter forms now that I've created over the past two years, I think. Um, there was a time when there was an app on the App Store way back in 2010, 2011, that you could draw with lettering. And it was really um, a favorite of mine because for me, letters, type and text tell us more than just a story. They tell us a feeling or a mood and they can be elements in a drama. So this is... Um, the letter R uh, coupled with a shape. And this is kind of my response to the medieval page that, that has text and image, where here the lines and the, sh the, the background shapes, which are a, a custom brush that I make these brushes using either drawings, paintings, or photographs. And it's kind of got a, a, a quality of writing to it, even though there are no letters in the piece. This one is about looking forward and looking back. The letter R is in the bottom right, but it's really discreet. It doesn't jump out at you. This is a fairly recent series, and um, I'm co-curating the Siberiana exhibition, so I took Part of the text from our press release and I superimposed it onto this um, painting. What I learned a long time ago uh, uh, is that you can't put text over image. As a graphic designer, it's, it's practically impossible to have your text be legible. And most, most of the time, I, I don't want to do that. But in this case, the, what you don't have to read it, you just have to, it's, this is a fairly simple um, Snell round hand. It's the name of the, the font. You don't have to read it in order to enjoy the play between the shapes of the letter forms and the background painting. Here I was really trying to make it legible and I just took a phrase from a novel and it's it's the novel is Gormenghast, which is a work that is like a world unto itself. And I often look through it for inspiration because sometimes language can trigger a flight of images. And I'm I'm combining work, these works are combining things that I'm making with mid-journey. So the faces are are made with mid-journey, and then the rest are the custom brushes and some of the elements that I create. This one has the letter B in the bottom right-hand corner. And behind the B, you'll see a, a gorilla. And I refer to these as my Tantan brushes. They're actual quotations from the graphic novels of the graphic novelist Hergé, the Belgian who created the beloved Tantan books. And in this case, there's even language in, in it. The, Gorilla is jumping up and down, and he's saying, whoa. This is made up gibberish. The blue letter forms are not words, but again, I'm putting them into the, the overall picture to kind of create a, a sense of something old and something new. This was a a work that I turned into a New Year's card. I've only sent it to three people though. <laughs> so kind of missed, missed timing on that. But again, it's trying, I'm trying really hard to make the text as legible as possible while being somehow in harmony with the other elements 
that are in the work and and color wise for it to also um see it seems should seem seamless and finally seth i i would like to show you a few works i made with your app yesterday and i did put an emoji in this one because i'm really fascinated with emojis if you blow an emoji up really large some of them are incredibly beautiful this one had a rose on it but when i was looking at it later i thought no the the, the font the text is enough you don't need to put another different element in there. So when I go back to your app today, I'm gonna to try working just with emojis. So um, there are about seven fonts to choose from on the app. And um, this one is Baskerville, I believe. And it, it, I'm trying to reference the, um, the French uh, slogan about liberty, equality, and, and freedom. And finally, my last image, is just that. And I want to say thank you to everybody for listening. Wow. Thanks, Renata. You're welcome. Oh, this, this is such a deep and wonderful subject. I think we're going to need to do an another <laughs> salon down the road on this topic because I think we've just scratched the surface and it's really it's really really fascinating so I want to give enough time for some discussion and Q and a so I'm I hope I hope I don't offend anybody by stopping any more presentations because I'd like to have some discussion on on the topic so, uh, if anybody has a question for any of the presenters, uh, you want to raise your hand and I'll, I'll call on folks or just chime in. Um, It's Roz. Hi, everybody. Roz. Here in Shelter Island, the booming metropolis. Um, I just want to say, I don't know if it's a question so much, but... Um, I really liked the Karen um, Karen's sound use in her piece this is this childlike artificial thing and i kind of i i thought that was effective um and i wondered if you might talk a little about that because it seemed otherworldly in a way like you know he was bringing the 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 real and the artificial together in a in a strange i just felt like the voice kind of worked you know and it's just like a <laughs> And it wasn't even annoying, but that like kind of really, you know, where did just tell us about that? Um, well, kind of like what Sick was saying, language to me is the whole thing. It's it's the gesture, it's the sound. I mean, originally we weren't writing things down, and when we communicated, we communicated in a, in a 3D space. And so when I come bring um the text into a, a film situation, it can become as virtual as I want it to be, which brings the elements back together in terms of communicating sound, text, words, et cetera. And so I started to think about, if you think of a memory as a child, you're kind of thinking of that memory in your adult voice, but it's so easy to go back in memory to the child you were. And so that's why I wanted a childlike sound to my voice. And this otherworldly thing just was great to run into because uh, I worked a lot with the different tones and speeds to get that, that sound. Um, it, it made the sense of going back to that memory and we all know our memories aren't exact, so it is going to be otherworldly when we go there. So yes, it was intentional. Thanks. Awesome. Cheryl, you have a question? Your hand's raised. Yes. The question is, um, um, the, um, the apps that were mentioned, I didn't, I didn't get a chance to write them down that people use all, all of you, I think have different, different little, little apps that you've discovered that make your work so interesting. And I was wondering if you could give that information or just write it down in the chat. 
Okay. Yeah, that's a great, great suggestion. Great request. Thanks. Cynthia DiDonato. Hello, everyone. I'm zooming in from North Providence, Rhode Island. Uh, I have to say I enjoyed every presentation today thoroughly. Um, it's incredible to see the uh, breadth and width of text and image, and uh, I thank you all for your presentations. I have a comment I wanted to make to um, Seth. Uh, I love that you're involved with this participatory artistic venture uh, that has uh, an educational aspect. Uh, I'm a retired English teacher. I have a tremendous love of language. And when I heard that you're using your, you use your app with uh, an educational, it, educational institutions, I thought that's bravo. Um, in, a, in a time when uh, young people are relying on emojis and abbreviations, when they converse with one another on their phones, here's a way to have text work with image and really hold up the importance of language uh, in its symbolic form and also in its meaning. So I, I thank you for doing that. Uh, thank you, Cynthia. I appreciate it. And it's something I love as well. It's also came as somewhat of a surprise, uh, only because the app is a public work on the App Store. And when it came out, uh, it, as it turned out, all a lot of teachers started downloading it and using it in schools. And then eventually I got I got wind of it uh, one way or the other uh, in, in New York City first and then from other teachers around the country so yeah it's it's been it's been great but then also i wound up doing the participation with the department of education and i also did a, a kind of um a, a one-week project with the middle school in east village and um kind of just went in there as a, a, a t teacher teaching artist uh with the teachers and working on a curriculum and that was really that was really nice to see uh especially middle schoolers who have a pretty good grasp of language especially new york kids um take the app and do exactly what you're talking about. Like start, they really actually play with the words, play with the actual physical device. They spin it around. Uh, there's there's a lot of playful, playful use of language at that age. And I think all children, but um, I don't know about you or everyone else, but when I learned poetry about poetry, uh, I went to a public school before I went to a private college. And it was the sort of cliche, you know, let's analyze Emily Dickinson today, and we're going to read the, the poem, and now we're going to analyze and, you know, co compare and contrast this stanza with another, and it was not very pleasant, <laughs> so uh, it's, 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 it's very uh, nice to see something in the schools that kids actually like <laughs> around, around text and poetry, um, and if they can be my app or anything else, that's great. I, I loved middle school students as well because they were so uh, willing to try and uh, be adventurous, whereas uh, high school students would learn to keep quiet and not really venture. Yeah. Do anything. So I think that age group really benefits from working with your app. So thank you. Oh, thank you. Uh, quick question, Seth. It's Roz again. Um, does your app have different um, languages like Spanish and other languages or is it English or did I miss something about that? Uh, yeah, I didn't mention it. It does. It's uh, it's called localized when you talk in the Apple speak. Um, so the, the language is localized of all things to Polish and Japanese so far. And that's because uh, I worked with a Polish programmer and his partner is Japanese, and both of them helped me localize the app into those languages. Um, I do want to expand to other languages, especially the top used ones like Spanish and German and um, Mandarin. But that actually is only for the the words that are in the app, like the instructions or the name, things like that, like the, the info screen. The actual, if, if you localize your app into a language, it, it will localize the keyboard and and whatnot. So the actual use of the app is totally international in terms of like a Spanish speaker. As long as as long as a speaker can speak English to read some of about the app, um, they can they they can and they do download. Like for example, Saudi Arabia. I don't know why it's really popular there. It's not like it's huge, but it's like in some countries, you would never guess why and how. And I I don't really know what's going on there. Uh, but more people download it there. Uh, and and I have I, I had uh, one artist in Iran 
uh, who used it and has liked it. And, you know, she shared a few um, works that were in the native language. So, and, and what, I don't know, for example, if those, I do have like a curated set of fonts, um, like Baskerville, for example, and I did specifically pick those and write a whole story of those fonts. What I don't know is I don't know if those actually localize, you know, I think you kind of just, I don't think you can use Baskerville and Mandarin, for example. Yeah. Unless they've, unless yeah. it's native that 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 Baskerville has been, I don't know how you would stylize Basker, Baskerville in a pictogram, but it could be could be cool. Well, there's just I, I love poetry, and I'm I'm kind of the old fogey type of love of poetry. Um, and yeah. I must say though, but studying poetry with others, the, the different languages, uh, you know, when things are translated differently, and this is a little bit more of the old school. Um, it's amazing how you'll read something that's been totally kind of bastardized in one translation, and then you really hear it in its native um, tongue um, and then translated mm -hmm. well, which is hard. I just thought it opens up a whole nother thing of sound and, you know, the interpretation of, of real poetry across an international spectrum of hieroglyphics that we're in right now. <laughs> yeah, I have, I, I see... Um... I see Karen has her hand up, but just real quick, things. I actually have been working with some free jazz artists and <clears throat> we did a performance in Kyoto together where they're improvising and I improvise with the app on a screen and we kind of we kind of go back and forth in the performance. I mean, they're New mostly New Yorkers, but we happen to just do it in, in Japan. But uh, but part of it is I tried to learn learn while I was there some Japanese characters and put them <laughs> up there. And I and I'm trying to get in a little bit of a tap to like almost like a sampler where I can tap the language and and I have it working. It sort of robotically says the words, but I want to get into it with these guys where I'm doing something like, you know, tapping a language on a beat, but also in different languages. Um, yeah, that will be that's like in development. Great, thank you. I, I you know it's same conversation. Um, I have a friend who translates into Mandarin and you know from English books, and sometimes it's like you know one language has to have so many characters in order to get a point across versus another. So uh, there has to be some kind of translating freeform to get the concept across. Uh, so I was interested how you are handling Mandarin because of this shift in how many words it takes to get a concept across. Um, Karen, is your question, if I switch to app to Mandarin, for example? Yeah. Or, well, that's why I haven't done it yet. I think it's a little bit, bit of a bigger grab than the Latin languages. Um, but, but I don't have, I try to limit the amount of actual text in the app in, in terms of like the screens and what, what needs to be told to people. I try to make it as much like a full screen. You just drop in, it's a blank slate, have fun with it. But there's only so far you can go with that because people get confused. And sometimes I get strange reviews on the app store, you know, like, well, I don't know. Like they just like the going for tech support on, on a review. It's kind of funny. But I think, uh, I think with Mandarin, I really just need to figure out the translation of, you know, into the characters with someone, uh, a native speaker, for example, of course. And then, and then it'll just be testing. Uh, you know, like t test with a, a, a few na native Mandarin speakers. Ideally, they'd be poets. Um, and luckily, actually, I, I know in that collective I mentioned, that TXC collective, there are native Mandarin uh, speakers uh, I can talk about, actually, that you're reminding me I should do that. Because some of the poems are actually being translated between Mandarin and English in that group. So that's a good good reminder to start on that. Maybe they'll help me. Yeah, my friend was, you know, she's going through what she has to do to translate English into Mandarin. And, and you know, sometimes oh. it just doesn't fit on the page. <laughs> you know? So right. I was curious how you were handling it. Thank you for the answer. Well, I'll shrink the typeface now. I don't know. Yeah. <laughs> we'll <see. 90. laughs> yeah. I would think it would be, there'd be enormous commercial application for this. And, and that isn't a bad word to use. I mean, I don't think it's fine to make money. <laughs> But I wonder, is that is that is it is it a app that you do sell? I do, and I'm I, I agree. It probably could have a lot of commercial uh, potential. Like I had, for example, when it came out, it's been out for a good while, by the way. Like the Creative Artist Artist Agency, which is this massive talent agency, contacted me from LA, and they yeah. said, "Oh, you know, look, we really want to give this to Demi Lovato and a bunch of pop stars." And I actually went and talked to them, but. I just thought, like, I looked at the roster and I said, well, you know what, just personally, I don't like Debbie Lovato. It's just, sorry, you know, like, <laughs> I know it'll probably be a big cash cow to, like, have a pop star, you know, put it on Instagram and like, we do some, I don't know, they were talking, in the beginning, I was head to head with the person, but then 
that's usually the lower down the ladder in these agencies. They're nice, good people. And then they got me to the MBA level, you know, the people that are like, okay, now let's talk, let's talk business. And they just want, they don't really want or know or understand art. So I think in a way I purposely shoot myself in the foot sometimes with the commercial potential uh, around the app. <clears throat> and uh, it's kind of difficult. Like with the schools, for example, there was a point where I started working with a professor at Columbia and a professor at NYU, and we were actually looking for some funding to, for research. Um, as they call it, it's called multimodal usage and education. Like if you can multimodal means there's multiple modes of the, of the language itself, but also if there's things like gesture and touching, and then there's, uh, there's, there, there are different modes of usage that they, that they studied. And we had a whole grant together. And it went up to the Department of Education for a big grant, but also it took so much time and they turned it down because we, you know, we were too weird, basically. It's, they didn't say that in direct words, but pretty much was that was the answer. So what I found is, yes, it does sell and it could be sold a lot more. But the, and the weird thing is when you come from art and you're making an art work and an art project or an art app, you, I, could, I know I could, turn, I could commercialize it. But then it would start pulling away from all the other work because it's just takes it's just time and hours, you know. Yeah, so, I totally get it. There's a price for everything, right? And, and I hear you. I, I really respect that answer a lot. Yeah, yeah. I just thought I'd give you the transparency answer. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So, so Seth, uh, you made a really interesting statement about going from physical to the web three space or digital and, and kind of living there almost some of the really fascinating things that you showed before is how people will take what you were displaying and then being able to mix the words around and not only change the meanings, but also they created kind of word clouds and, and, just an artistic approach to that in a web three space, you, you could take that to, to the next level in, in regards to what you can do digitally that you can't necessarily do in a physical space. And I don't know if you've been thinking creative thoughts on, on that, you know, kind of going in that direction at all. Yeah, I, totally. I put some proposals together before, for example, uh, out in, I think it was LACMA, um, because they had a NVIDIA contract or, or support. So I put together proposals because I think if you want to go, if you want to stay native to digital, but still bring back the tactile uh, group collaborative artworks, it's like, it can't be a projection screen that's sensing people because it's, it'll have too much delay. Like the, the latency won't work. Like you'd have to have a massive screen, just an example, in a place that is touch sensitive. It's programmed well. That's in the physical space. And then like you're saying in the metaverse, uh, it's probably the place to do it. Because like in the metaverse, you could program everything and it could be set up in the space. And then all the users can be there as avatars and basically start moving and changing. But even that uh, does would require X amount of programming, you sure. know, like to kind of get it, to get the, get the situation and set up to work in a way that feels kind of, settled in, 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 a, in a in a soulful way, I guess, is probably for lack of better words, because when you do things, I found when you do things in the physical world, yes, you're limited, but you're using everything you're using. It's physical matter. You're, you, you can sculpt the physical experience in a way that feels right, because, well, obviously it feels right because it's the, exactly the thing you, you, that you're, feel, you're looking at and touching. But I feel like when you're dealing with the sort of, you're dealing with the metaverse or even digital media and even these screens, you're starting to remove parts of that soulful grounded experience. And for me, it's really important. Like I, I feel like that, that cold disconnected uh, lack of feeling experience is, is sort of proliferated across uh, not just the commercial uh, venues like Instagram, but also in that digital art space. So yeah. 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 I like to do it. I think it's great. Uh, I, I want to, I'm starting with this early experiment, for example, with these NFTs that, that you could have the interactive file and then that would be basically that would just be the buyer that gets it and that's nice but that's more like an art collector's sort sure. of perspective it's a limited it's, a, it's sort of uh false scarcity <clears throat> which i'm torn about myself so i i do think the sort of mass public aspect is worthwhile and really interesting and i'd like to figure it out 
for for lack of a better answer. <laughs> cool. Well, we've got a couple more minutes, I think, before we're hitting our hour and a half mark. So does anybody have any questions, comments, feedback? I just wanted to say um, one thing, um, you know, I initially was introduced to Seth um, by Paul Miller. And, you know, it made me think that probably a lot of us have, you know, friends or, or colleagues or other artists that we know that might not be really participating in, you know, these salons or involved in text expressionism in any kind of direct way. And I think it's, you know, uh, an opportunity to bring these people in and, you know, introduce them to the community, but also to bring in people who have, you know, a wide, diverse array of work and experience. Um, and a lot of times, you know, it's it's the people that are sort of the regulars here showing. And I think it's interesting, you know, to, to have some people come in and sort of circulate. And, um, you know, I just wanted to put that out there because I'm sure each one of us have you know, friends and, and other people that we know, other artists that are working, you know, in, in some way that's tangential to technology or maybe even deeply involved in technology. And that's, you know, a way to keep the this project, you know, growing and circulating with new people because early on, that's all it was, you know, and it's kind of like distilled into sort of a group, in, you know, Helen Harrison um, had said in the beginning, you know, maybe organize a show and see who sticks around and that'll kind of shake out, you know, who's, who's really going to stay involved in the project. Um, and it's kind of, you know, it, it's kind of come to fruition in the sense that that's, you know, there's a core group of people that are usually here. Um, but yeah, I just wanted to put that out there because, um, you know, it's always really interesting, um, you know, and hopefully Seth, you know, you, you come back and, and join us for future things, or if you know any other people that might be interested, definitely, you know, send them um, our way. We do, you know, it's the first Thursday of every month, so it's pretty easy to remember at noon. And, um, you know, we're always um, doing new things, and other people in the group are doing all these interesting initiatives like Siberiana, which I think is really exciting. So, um, yeah, just wanted to put my two cents in. Cool. Great, great point, Colin. Uh, Cynthia Beth Rubin. Yeah, so, I'm sorry, I can't get my hand to raise. So <laughs> um, I don't know why. <laughs> I just wanted to, to mention two things. Um, one is that we now have enabled simultaneous translation and captions um, in the text expression of Zoom. Um, so if you're thinking about inviting people who are not English speakers, go ahead, invite them. Um, it's, of course, it's not perfect. It's like any other automatic translation, but it opens up the community. Um, and the other thing is to put in a plug again to remind people that some of us are meeting every Tuesday for virtual co-working. So, um, <laughs> which is just kind of you come in for, and you say what work you're gonna do and then you go mute for an hour and you, do the work that you're committed to doing, and then you come back and you share it with people. So it's a totally different way of working together, but some of us have got to know each other really well through that. So, okay. And thank you. This was a fabulous session. I mean, the conceptually very, very stimulating and it's wonderful yeah. to have the conceptually, conceptual stimulating, conceptual stimulation. Okay. Thanks. I echo exactly what you just said, Cynthia. <laughs> it's really awesome topic. Cynthia, and the presentations the have been wonderful. Uh, the the translation, is that something that's done um, at the user end? Like, you know, I'm not 100% clear, even though I sort of enabled the option of how that actually works. Like, does the host need to enable closed captioning and then the user selects a language or? No, in fact, thanks to you, Colin you enabled it for the text expressionist account. So I think it works whenever people are using that account and you just down in the bottom where those different options, one of them is um, closed captioning and then you can select your language. So you can keep it to English if someone's um, sound isn't that good or if they're speaking 
with an accent that's a little difficult for you to understand, it actually, or if you have any hearing problems, um, it actually works even English to English. And then um, it also does, it's not very good translation, but good enough for people to follow along. And um, what we found is that there are people who are comfortable um, speaking about their own work sometimes in English, but they don't have to be, anyone can do it. Um, but it, it helps them follow along when we're moving really fast if English is the second language and you know you have to hesitate and think about what somebody's saying. So uh, encourage your friends all over the world to join in is the bottom line. Awesome, thanks so much. Um, and you're, um, it just made me think also about the fact that you know we early on had been doing this sort of artist interview artists piece of the project which was sort of inspired by interview magazine world's kind of idea of like artists, you know, interviewing other artists versus a journalist interviewing an artist. And we haven't really done any in a long time, or there hasn't been very much of that, you know, happening in terms of it being published on the site, but I'm happy to, to post, you know, interviews. If any of you guys want to interview each other, just do a zoom recording you know, um, the, the reason it popped into my head is that now, you know, with closed captioning, I realized the entire transcript can also be exported as a text document, which makes, you know, that whole process have another facet in terms of, you know, the ability to have a written transcript. But certainly it'd be cool to pick up on that. I don't think we've done any since the Southampton show. I think the last one might have been Frank Gillette. Um, I interviewed Nina Sobel, I think it was October of in the fall. Oh, okay. That's right. That was the most recent one, right? That's that's live now, right up on the site. Yeah, yeah that's on the site. So, so yeah, but definitely, you know, um, if any of you guys, um, you know, want to pair up and, and do an interview, certainly I would encourage that because um, that's always good material to, to publish both on the YouTube channel and on the site. Cool. Well, I think we should wrap wrap things up and do the after party afterward. Sure. Um, that sounds good to me. So I'd just like to thank you, Michael, for, um, you know, moderating and uh, all of the artists um, for presenting and really a great topic. Um, you know, I think that, um, like you said, Michael, it's definitely something that uh, could be revisited yeah. you know, um, in the future. Uh, there's definitely, you know, a bunch of other artists that I thought about that, um, you know, their work definitely speaks to this topic. So, um, okay. so yeah, it was, it's a great salon. Um, I think that, you know, um, going to this once a month timeline um, works well. And um, yeah, without uh, further ado, I will close the recording, but if um, you guys want to stick around, for the after party slash advisory board uh, meeting, which is kind of our tongue in cheek, but um, <laughs> that's usually where the, the action happens as far as new initiatives or people kind of like just um, schmoozing or whatever. But uh, it looks like that we have a new topic for the next salon, which is photography, um, which is really cool. And Renata's um, volunteered to moderate. So um, that takes one item off the table. So um, yeah, you're all welcome to hang out and I'll keep the recording going. So I will stop recording in three, two, one and cut.